My name is Doug Turnbull, and as said, I'm Vice Chairman and Country Head for DBRS Morningstar. For those unfamiliar with my company, we're the leading credit rating agency in Canada. We're the fourth largest in the world, and we're headquartered right here in Toronto. Our company provides analysis, research, and expert opinions on the credit worthiness of banks, insurance companies, corporations, and governments around the world. I might add, including Canada, which is one of only 13 nations that we rate as AAA. We rate credit cards, mortgages, auto loans, as well as most structured finance entities. We rate major league sports teams and their stadiums. We rate container terminals and ports, toll roads, and generating facilities. And we rate project finance and infrastructure in pretty much all its forms. We and our parent company, Morningstar Inc., a global provider of independent equity, and mutual fund research operates in 27 countries around the world. Our keynote speaker is well known to Canadians across this country, as well as being widely respected around the world. Ms. Freeland was first elected as a member of parliament for Toronto Centre in July 2013. He was then elected as a member for University Rosedale in 2015 and again in 2019. From 2015 to 2017, Ms. Freeland served as Canada's Minister of International Trade, overseeing the historic and successful negotiation of Canada's free trade agreement with the European Union. From January 2017 to November 2019, she served as Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs, during which time she was a leading advocate for democracy, human rights, and multilateralism around the world. And, I might add, drawing the condemnation of more than a few unsavory regimes in some dangerous neighborhoods on this globe. As Foreign Minister, Ms. Freeland led and successfully concluded the renegotiation of the North American Free Trade Agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. In November 2019, Ms. Freeland was appointed Deputy Prime Minister of Canada and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs. In that capacity, he led Canada's united response to the COVID-19 pandemic. He was appointed Minister of Finance in August 2020. I won't read the rest of her bio, but trust me when I say that Ms. Freeland has had a remarkable life to date. He was born in Peace River, Alberta, was educated at Harvard, and went on to complete a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford. He was a leading journalist for some of the great news, news organizations in the English-speaking world, namely the Financial Times of London, the Washington Post, and The Economist, as well as Thomson Reuters. Ms. Freeland is an award-winning author, has been awarded numerous prizes for her diplomatic and human rights efforts, and if that's not enough, she speaks Russian, Ukrainian, Italian, French, and English. And she lives right here in Toronto with her husband and three children. It is my great honor to introduce a true Canadian superstar at home and around the world, the Honourable Christia Freeland. Okay, well, thank you very, very much, Doug, for that extremely kind introduction. Uh, I am, uh, maybe uh, the camera doesn't indicate it, but I was blushing as you were talking. I really appreciate it. Uh, so good afternoon, bonjour. I'm very grateful to the Toronto Global Forum for this invitation. Let me begin by telling you what I won't be talking about today. I will not be giving you a detailed accounting of all of the measures our government has taken so far to fight the COVID-19 pandemic or a description of our specific plans for the coming months. Nor will I offer fiscal projections for the years ahead. Our government has committed to releasing fiscal projections this fall, and those are coming soon. Instead, what I intend to talk about today is the economic rationale driving our response to this global pandemic and the strategy that underpins our phased plan for a robust, lasting recovery from the coronavirus recession. Since the spring, we have been swept up in a tempest and forced to sail in uncharted waters. But our government has a plan. We have a compass. 
We know now how to get to a safe harbor and what to do when we get there. Vous connaissez déjà l'essentiel de notre politique. Elle consiste à mettre en place toutes les mesures nécessaires afin de protéger la santé, les emplois et le niveau de vie des Canadiens et Canadiens. Nous débrasser de la COVID-19 aussi rapidement que possible et ensuite de favoriser l'établissement de l'économie la plus forte, la plus résiliente, la plus innovatrice la plus compétitive à l'échelle mondiale et la plus inclusive possible. Nous avons mis en place des mesures vigoureuses pour aider les travailleurs et les entreprises du Canada, financer directement nos provinces et territoires, acheter des vaccins, de l'équipement de protection individuelle et des technologies de dépistage, fournir des chambres d'hôtel à ceux et celles qui sont en quarantaine et embaucher du personnel pour la recherche du contact. Et au printemps dernier, lorsque on en avait besoin, les femmes et les hommes des forces armées canadiennes sont intervenus pour s'occuper de nos années et les protéger. So, you already know what our essential policy is. It is to do whatever it takes to protect Canadians' health, jobs, and living standards, to put COVID-19 behind us as quickly as we can, and then to foster the strongest, the most resilient, the most innovative, the most globally competitive, and the most inclusive economy possible. And we've put in place strong measures to help Canadian workers and Canadian businesses, to fund our provinces and territories directly, to buy vaccines, PPE and testing technologies, and to provide quarantine hotels and contact tracers. And last spring, when the need was most acute, the women and men of the Canadian Armed Forces went in to care for and to protect our elders. We are doing everything in our power. Keep Canadians healthy, safe, and solvent. This approach is, of course, fully in line with our government's values. We believe passionately in a Canada where we take care of each other, particularly the most vulnerable among us. Seniors, women, young people, Indigenous peoples, Black and other racialized Canadians. And I'm so proud to say that is what Canadians are doing with our government support from coast, coast, coast. But while I suspect you can all see how our response is consistent with our government's deeply held ideals, I have a sneaking suspicion you may be less certain of the economic rationale for our approach. So that is what I will outline for you here today. Our policies have a heart, to be sure, but they are driven just as powerfully by a prudent, dispassionate economic calculus. One that is extraordinarily important because the truth is that we are living through a particular moment in history when doing good, supporting each other through a hard time is exactly what is required to do well, keeping our economy strong as the coronavirus ravages the world. Our first economic calculation is the simplest. Fighting the coronavirus isn't cheap. Medical care and PPE and therapeutics and vaccines and testing and tracing all cost money. And there is also a secondary cost, fighting the coronavirus one that turns out to be even more expensive. This pandemic, we have learned, can only be slowed and stopped by limiting social contacts, which means restricting economic activity. It means asking people to stay home from work if they or their children are ill. It means asking restaurants to serve fewer people. 
or to shut down indoor dining altogether. It means limiting travel across our borders and even within our own country. Maintenant, si on voulait se faire l'avocat du diable, on pourrait dire que ces restrictions économiques n'ont pas nécessairement à venir à leur dire le budget fédéral. Selon certains, le fardeau de la pandémie pourrait reposer principalement sur les épaules des personnes directement touchées. Ce serait, je suppose, une solution où chacun tenterait de se débrouiller par soi-même comme il le peut. Mais cette notion s'écroule face à la réalité, comme le plan de bataille d'un général lorsqu'il entre en contact avec l'ennemi. Dans le concret, c'est simplement impossible, en plus d'être injuste, de demander aux travailleurs de rester chez eux ou aux entreprises de fermer leurs portes sans leur accorder le soutien financier dont ils ont besoin pour compenser leur perte du revenu. Les travailleurs et les entreprises refuseraient tout simplement d'obéir, ce qui causerait une déchirure dans notre tissu social, comme cela s'est produit dans d'autres régions du monde, entretenant, entre, entraînant des conséquences mortelles. Now, if you were to play the penny-pinching devil's advocate, you might argue that these economic restrictions need not necessarily weigh on the federal purse. The pandemic burden could, some might contend, be borne chiefly by the individuals directly affected. That would be, I suppose, a rugged bootstrapper solution. But that notion dissolves upon contact with real life just as a general battle plans do on contact with the enemy. It is just not practically possible, never mind fair, to ask workers to stay home or businesses to shut their doors without providing them with the financial support they need to compensate for lost income. People and businesses would simply refuse to comply, tearing our social fabric apart as we have seen happen in other parts of the world with deadly consequences. So providing support to those who need it is what we have done and what we will continue to do. It is the economically smart thing to do. And it comes back to this guiding principle of pandemic response. Our economy will only be able to recover fully once we have defeated the virus. This leads me to the second calculation underlying our coronavirus spending. It is this, the wisest macroeconomic approach this global pandemic is to help Canadian businesses and Canadian families get through to the other side without going broke. We want to give our businesses and our households a bridge so that as many of them as possible make it through, viable and intact. Now, as I've said, this is the compassionate thing to do. It is also the pragmatic thing to do. The economic shock that we're witnessing as a result of COVID-19 is unlike the crises I covered as a financial reporter and editor, whether that be the financial crisis of 2008, the Asian currency crisis of 1997-98, or even the collapse of communism a decade before that. It is not due to a design flaw in our economy or in our businesses. We didn't get here because of greed or recklessness. The market isn't correcting for a flaw. This was a completely exogenous stock. Our citizens and our companies are suffering through no fault of their own. For a government to abandon them at a time like this would be monstrous. And it wouldn't be just heartless. It would be a profound economic mistake. 
That is because our eventual recovery will be faster and more complete in direct proportion to how much we limit the economic scarring caused by the coronavirus recession. If we can keep permanent economic harm to a minimum, if our businesses are able to get back to full speed the moment all restrictions are lifted, and if Canadian families have the means to spend on the goods and services they will then want and need, well, then, once the virus is vanquished, our rebound will be more rapid and more robust. This is the lesson of the 2008 recession, when too many countries, including Canada, found their recoveries hamstrung by scarring that occurred during the economic downturn, prolonged by premature fiscal tightening in the years that followed. In order for the small family restaurant or mid-sized manufacturer to come back stronger, it must first survive the winter. Its owners have to make rent. They have to keep their experienced and knowledgeable staff on the payroll. For our economy to come roaring back in the spring, we need to be sure that our businesses do not permanently close their doors during the dark, cold months to come. As the Prime Minister has said, we can and we will do everything in our power to limit job losses and business closings and to minimize the decline in economic activity. By doing that, we will make it easier for Canada to rebound energetically once we have a vaccine. But we know some damage is inevitable. After all, this virus has already caused the deepest recession worldwide since the Great Depression. That is why limiting the economic damage is a necessary, but not a sufficient condition for future growth. Which brings me to the next step in our plan. To ensure that our recovery is as broad, robust, and complete as possible, we will need to build our way back. Targeted carefully thought out investment on a meaningful scale is how we will climb out of the coronavirus recession most quickly and most effectively. That will be the final task on our agenda once we have conquered COVID-19. And I will have more to say about this as well in the coming weeks. Now, on some level, the thinking I've outlined here is entirely uncontroversial. We're Canadian. We know government spending on health care works. None of us believes it's fair or right for a worker who lost her job because of COVID-19 to be unable to feed her children, pay her bills, or keep her home. We all want our beloved local coffee shops to stay in business, even if the pandemic is eating into their already thin margins. And bearing in mind the lengthy, lengthy aftermath of the Great Recession, we understand that aggressive federal stimulus is essential to building our way out of a deep downturn. This one is worse than 2008. It stands to reason we will need to invest more, not less. So the concern about pandemic spending is not about our aims or our intent. It's about capacity. Canadians are careful about their nation's finances. I know this very personally. I'm from rural Northern Alberta, which is not culturally a place much steeped in the ideas of helicopter money. And the question I hear from there, and here in downtown Toronto too, is this. Can we afford it? I'm going to start with a simple answer, and then I will elaborate. La réponse est simple. Oui, nous le pouvons. Permettez-moi 
de vous dire pourquoi. D'abord, nous sommes entrés dans la crise avec les moyens financiers dont nous avions besoin pour réaliser notre plan. C'est une fait et non une opinion. Quand la COVID-19 nous a frappés, le Canada avait le plus faible ratio de la dette nationale au PIB parmi les pays du G7. Aujourd'hui, même après la plus forte explosion de dépenses d'urgence depuis la Seconde Guerre mondiale, le Canada devrait conserver le plus faible ratio de la dette nationale au PIB au G7. À notre solidité financière relative s'ajoute la conjecture économique mondiale. Les taux d'intérêt ont rarement été aussi bas, en particulier pour des piliers économiques comme le Canada. Malgré nos dépenses sans précédent pour lutter contre le coronavirus, les frais d'intérêt qui incombent au Canada en ce moment n'ont jamais été aussi bas en 100 ans en proportion du PIB. Vous avez bien compris, au cours du dernier siècle, on n'a jamais payé aussi peu d'intérêt sur notre dette par rapport à la taille de notre économie. So, the simple answer is, yes, we can afford it. And let me now tell you why. First, because we entered this crisis with the fiscal firepower to do what we need to do. This is a fact, not an opinion. When COVID-19 hit, Canada had the lowest net debt to GDP ratio in the G7. Today, following our country's most aggressive burst of emergency spending since the Second World War, Canada is still expected to have the lowest net debt to GDP ratio in the G7. Added to our relative fiscal strength is the prevailing global economic climate. Interest rates are at historic lows, particularly for fiscal stalwarts like Canada. Notwithstanding our unprecedented spending to fight the coronavirus, Canada's interest charges as a share of GDP today are at a 100-year low. That's right. Today, we are spending less to cover interest on our debt relative to the size of our economy than at any time in the past century. To put this in perspective, in 1995, Canada's debt servicing costs as a percentage of GDP were 6%. Today, even after the unprecedented expense of battling the pandemic over these past months, that figure is expected to be 0.9% of GDP. And we are locking in these low costs by issuing more debt into longer term instruments at these historically low rates. Now, for Canadians of a certain vintage, and I freely admit to being one of them, the idea of increasing government debt holds particular terrors. We remember the fiscal shock of the 1990s when Canada flirted with insolvency. And especially among those of us who cherish the accomplishments of Paul Martin and Jean Chrétien, we remember how Canadians heroically and through great sacrifice climbed our way out of that debt purgatory and built up the fiscal war chest that is serving us so well today. Both the terror and the triumph were formative for a generation of Canadians. But it's a poor general who fights the last war. And the reality is that today, the prevailing global economic environment is changed entirely. In fact, not one of the factors that drove the fiscal crisis of the 1990s holds true today. Let me repeat, 
not a single one. It's true that interest rates easily outpaced growth in the 1980s and 1990s. But as Olivier Blanchard, the former chief economist of the International Monetary Fund, pointed out in a seminal paper last year, those two decades seem to be an anomaly. Over the past 80 years, with the exception of the 1980s and the 1990s, the pattern is the one we see today, where growth exceeds interest rates. As we look ahead to an industrialized world with an aging population and a tendency toward secular stagnation, deflation and subpar growth seem likely to pose greater risks than the twin threats of inflation and spiraling debt that Mr. Chrétien and Mr. Martin successfully countered in the 1990s. The upshot is that we are living today in a world where the risks of fiscal inaction outweigh the risks of fiscal action. Doing too little is more dangerous and potentially more costly than doing too much. And this is not an idiosyncratic view. It is the new consensus, including among Canada's major banks. Let me quote. Quote, while interest rates are extremely low, the IBC Capital Market said in a note last month, governments can and should ramp up borrowing and spend to cushion the economy from COVID's wrath. Larger debt loads are also less of a scare story if, as we expect, we don't see a return to the interest rate environment of the 1980s and 1990s. End quote. Just as there are no atheists in foxholes, it seems there are few disciples of Ayn Rand in a pandemic. We're all in this together. Now, even as I utter these words, I feel what may be a peculiarly Canadian discomfort. We are, after all, the inheritors of a society built on the ideals of peace, order, and good government rather than the seductions of revolutionary change. Caution is a very Canadian virtue. But let's also remember this. Canada is a hugely diverse country built by the resilience and wisdom of Indigenous peoples and the courage and endurance of immigrants who bore great risks built new lives here, as well as their descendants. As Margaret Atwood concluded, in her groundbreaking survey of Canadian literature, we are, first and foremost, a country of survivors. And one of the first lessons of survival is that you must do whatever it takes, whatever you can, when the wolf is at the door. To coin a gentler metaphor, surely the purpose of fiscal rigor is to prepare us for a rainy day. And I think we can all agree that that proverbial rain is falling today and falling hard. As the Financial Post's Kevin Carmichael recently pointed out, yes, it's unfair to saddle the next generation with our debt, but it would be worse to bequeath them with a weak economy, end quote. Precisely. Having said that, let me offer this important caveat. While advocating expansive fiscal policy to battle COVID-19 and to grow our way out of the coronavirus recession, I am not among those who think Canada should have a fling with modern monetary theory, which holds that deficits don't matter for a government that issues debt in its own currency. Whether on Bay Street or on Main Street, there are no blank checks and there are no free lunches. Our fiscally expansive approach to fighting the coronavirus cannot and will not be infinite. It is limited and it is temporary. A smart and careful government, and those are two adjectives I would use to characterize our policy, will impose those limits upon itself. 
rather than waiting for the more brutal external restraints of international capital markets. I will have further thoughts to share soon about the fiscal rules and limits by which we will govern ourselves. Today, we have a moral imperative, but also a hard economic imperative to fight the coronavirus with all our might and to provide our people and our businesses with a bridge to get through to the other side. As we beat down this virus, we will need to provide meaningful investment to build our way out of the coronavirus recession and to ensure our economy comes roaring back stronger than before. That will mean laying a foundation for an innovation economy, for a green economy, and for a fair economy that supports good jobs for all Canadians. It means ensuring that our recovery is long lasting, robust, and equitable. And as that occurs, we will resume the long standing, time tested Canadian approach with fiscal guardrails and fiscal anchors that preceded this pandemic. For these are the very policies that left us so well positioned to meet this truly generational challenge. Today, I've cited historical experience and economic research to buttress my argument. But we've now been fighting the coronavirus for many months. We have some initial evidence about what actually works economically and what doesn't. And the good news is that Canada's COVID-19 response from public health to support for provinces and territories and municipalities to emergency economic programs that sustain workers and businesses has fostered a promising, though still uneven, employment rebound. Economists from TD Bank noted last week that job growth in Canada now exceeds the rate in the United States, the international economy with which we are most closely tied. That divergence led the bank to suggest it may be time to amend the adage we all know so well, that when the US sneezes, Canada catches cold. Instead, the analysts offered, perhaps we should now say, when the US sneezes, Canada builds antibodies. I like the sound of that. Now, let me end these remarks by placing our own debates in an international context. Two weeks ago, the fall IMF World Bank meetings took place, held virtually this year, of course. Two things struck me about those meetings. The first was the clear consensus that for countries that can afford it, now is not the time for half measures. Finance ministers from the, around the world agreed that the risk of withdrawing support too soon outweighs the danger of spending too much. Second, there was broad international agreement that with interest rates approaching zero, monetary policy is running out of bullets. That puts the onus squarely on fiscal policy to grow our way out of this recession. A generation ago, prudence meant deep cuts, public spending. Today, it means that we support our people and our businesses as they battle this pandemic, then move beyond it and ultimately thrive in the recovery that will follow. It's notable that the leaders of the charge for expansive fiscal policy this year in 2020 are none other than the flinty-eyed economists of the IMF, formerly the high priests and chief theologians of austerity. As the Financial Times put it in an editorial commending this historic turnaround, coronavirus has led to economic disruption on a scale not seen since the Second World War. As was the case after 1945, 
state investment is necessary to rebuild economies and provide jobs. The IMF's message is that premature fiscal tightening in the aftermath of the crisis will harm, not heal, economies. It is one that ought to be welcomed and heeded by politicians. I could not have put it better myself. This is the right policy for the world. It is the right policy for Canada. And it is one that this Canadian politician is very committed to heeding. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. In your remarks, you talk about how well Canada was prepared going into this pandemic. In DBRS Morningstar's analysis to support our AAA rating, we say, amongst other things, and I quote, these credit challenges arising from the pandemic are offset by Canada's considerable fundamental strengths, including its sound macroeconomic policy framework, a large and diverse economy, and strong governing institutions. We go on to say, and I quote, in our view, the federal government has space to provide temporary fiscal stimulus of this size while maintaining the AAA rating, end of quote. Um, I wonder how you, you touched on this towards the end of your comments, but I wonder how you uh, think about the duration of the crisis and its potential to require greater support for longer than forecast. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the question and thank you again for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, and uh, thank you, Doug, if I may, for quoting from that report. I read it with great interest uh, when it was first uh, when it first came out on September 22nd. I think I even quoted it in the House of Commons. Um, as you noted, uh, I was careful in my prepared remarks to underscore that our expansive fiscal policy is limited and it must be temporary. Now, you're quite right to point out that none of us has a crystal ball. Uh, we need to maintain this expansive policy until we have done two things. The first one is getting on top of the coronavirus. We have to flatten the curve and we have to support individual Canadians and Canadian businesses while we are taking the necessary actions to do that. And there is then going to be a second step, and I touched on that today, and I'm going to have more to say in the days to come. And that is, we are also experiencing a coronavirus recession. And we are going to have to build our way out of that recession that will require government investment. That government investment is going to need to be smart. It's going to need to be thoughtful. It's going to need to be carefully targeted and time limited. And it's going to need to be focused on getting Canadians back work. In the throne speech, we promised to create, to support Canadians as they create a million new jobs. There are about 750,000 Canadians who don't have a job today, who had one before coronavirus struck. We're all going to have to work hard, including the federal government, with investments to get those Canadians back to work, and we will do this. But I do want to emphasize these are two very time-limited tasks, and we very much understand that they need to be time-limited. Thank you. Uh, for our, our uh, conference attendees, uh, you should know that um, the minister and I didn't compare notes uh, before this, and so she doesn't know what questions I'm asking. However, your response is a nice uh, on-ramp to my second question, and that's with respect to climate change. Uh, clearly, it is shaping up to be the defining issue of our generation. Every jurisdiction is struggling in many cases, to even achieve consensus on whether it's occurring and what's causing it, much less how to address it. What role do you see your government playing in driving public and private entities to adapt and to meet the challenges? Um, well, thank you for the question. And uh, for sure, we didn't compare notes. But I did uh, read the DBRS Morningstar report carefully when you first issued it. 
um, uh, it was uh, very, very well done, really useful. And so maybe I had a bit of a hint of what your thinking might be. Um, on climate change, a really core question. Um, let me start where you started, Doug, which is we have an advantage today in Canada compared to some other countries in that I think we have at this point a broad consensus across the country that climate change is real, that we must act, that we must act urgently, and even that there is real economic opportunity in acting urgently. The whole world is moving towards a clean and green economy. And we need to be sure that Canada isn't left behind, that we are positioned, that our businesses, our people are positioned to take advantage of that move to a green economy. Uh, what does the government have to do? I think the government needs to do a few things. The first is to create the right incentives for Canadians and Canadian companies to do the right thing. And that's why the price on pollution that our government has introduced is so important. You know, economists across the political spectrum are agreed that a price on pollution is the single most effective way to get people to change their behaviors and to move to a green economy. And what is so important about the Canadian approach is this price on pollution is revenue neutral. All the money goes back to Canadians as it should. So that's a very important thing for the government to do. And then I think a second really important thing is we have to make investments to help individual Canadians and Canadian businesses shift to a green economy. And an important and to me really exciting example I would uh, offer you is the uh, investment by the government of Canada, by the province of Ontario, to help Ford build electric cars in Canada. The auto sector is such an important part of our economy, such an important source of jobs and growth. And helping our car sector, car sector to shift to electric and zero emission vehicles is one example of how we shift our whole economy. And I can't resist adding that the rules of origin in NAFTA and the provisions for car exports to Europe included in our CETA trade deal with Europe have both provided a very important underpinning for that decision by Ford to build those vehicles here in Canada. Thank you. Um, my last question uh, really comes from the opportunity of addressing you directly. Uh, and I know that our conference attendees wouldn't, uh, wouldn't want to miss this opportunity. Um, but I also know that you're an experienced enough diplomat that you're not going to probably give me a direct answer as to uh, the outcome of the U.S. election. Well, I, I guess what I would like to understand is how you think about the impact on the Canadian economy uh, of either outcome. Um, you know, you always know as a politician that when someone uh, praises you as a diplomat while asking a question, they're really hoping you will be undiplomatic. Uh, and I'm afraid I'm not going to satisfy that desire. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's a really, really important question. Um, I referred in my remarks uh, to that old saying, when the U.S. sneezes, Canada catches cold. I really like the idea that we're getting to a stage where when the U.S. sneezes, we build antibodies. Uh, but my reference to the United States was intentional because you can't talk about the Canadian economy without talking about the American economy. We all know that. And, you know, the prime minister has said, and he's quite right, that one of the principal jobs of a prime minister is to manage to effectively handle that relationship with the U.S., and that is true of any Canadian federal government. Uh, in our first mandate, and indeed up to now, um, that has been a central, necessarily central, 
focus and preoccupation of our government, and it will continue to be. What I would like to assure Canadians is just as in 2016, um, we prepared then carefully for any possible election outcome. And I can tell you in 2016, the day after the election, I was so happy to have on my desk, prepared by Canada's outstanding trade negotiators, a report they had prepared in August of 2016, talking about what Canada's position should be should a new U.S. administration seek to renegotiate NAFTA. That was very important that they had anticipated that possibility and that we were ready to go. And likewise, when it comes to the U.S. election next week, either outcome will be significant for Canada. Uh, we have spent a lot of time carefully analyzing what either outcome would mean. We have a fantastic ambassador, Kirsten Hillman, in Washington, and we all work closely with her. So, you know, Canadians know this election will have an impact on us, but it's not our decision. What our job is, is to be as well positioned as possible to react to their outcome. Maybe I should say to any possible outcome. And I might just conclude, Doug, by saying what is so important and I think has been central to Canada's handling of the challenges we faced from the United States in recent years, like the NAFTA negotiation, has been the Team Canada approach people across the country have taken. Mayors, premiers critically, business leaders, labor leaders, and I have every expectation that that is the approach our country will continue to take when it comes to dealing with the U.S. And I have to say, I think that's the approach that we've been taking together when it comes to fighting the coronavirus. And it has been an essential part of our response. Minister, we're very mindful that you and your government uh, are running hard to balance all of your responsibilities and priorities get our country safely through this crisis. On behalf of the Toronto Global Forum, I want to thank you for addressing today's conference and for taking my questions. Thank you very much. Stay safe.